Welcome to the fourth webinar in the series Tourism, Sustainability and Recovery, Asia Pacific Ex Expert Outlook. My name is Joseph Chia. I will be moderating this webinar this evening here in Wakayama. I'm professor at the Center for Tourism Research uh, at Wakayama University. Tonight, we go to um, both ends of the world. Um, we uh, extend a warm welcome and a huge thanks to our presenters, Professor James Hyam from the University of Otago in New Zealand in the Southern Hemisphere. And then we flick to the Northern Hemisphere where we welcome Associate Professor Debbie Hopkins from the University of Oxford. Thank you both for joining us. Um, as always, we welcome an international audience with participants from many countries across the Asia and the Pacific region, Europe and the Americas. And tonight in particular, we have participants from over 30 countries, including Great Britain, USA, Australia, the Philippines, New Zealand, Cyprus, Germany, Malaysia, Taiwan, Uzbekistan, Indonesia, China, Brazil, Nepal, and India, among others. So we're very grateful that you have joined us, um, especially for those who've had to get up very early or, or are staying awake way beyond your usual bedtime, like uh, Professor Hyams is. Here at the Center for Tourism Research at Wakayama University, our aim is to be a key hub for tourism research in the Asia Pacific region, and tonight's webinar is part of that mission. So this webinar series features presenters at the leading edge of tourism research and practice, like the two presenters we have this evening. And while a focus is on the Asia Pacific region, we also have an overarching emphasis on global tourism because the two are inseparable. But we also acknowledge the support of tourism industry partners, the Pacific Asia Travel Association, the UNWTO Regional Office here in, uh, in, in, uh, in Japan, and the Kansai Tourism Bureau. So with that, with that welcome um, done, uh, today's webinar is titled Decarbonizing Academic Conference Travel. It's a topic that's very dear to a lot of us because in 2020, we haven't been able to go to conferences, right? So um, this topic is very relevant. So we're very fortunate to have two speakers, both exceptional scholars in their own right, and with a track record of collaborating on research that examines sustainable tourism, as well as more nuanced insights into particular aspects of transport, climate change, and behavior change. So importantly, both speakers undertake research that makes important contributions to tourism and practice. Um, and um, tonight we'll be going from, we're going to be going to New Zealand first and then to Great Britain. At the end of the speaking section of the webinar, there's an opportunity to have your questions answered. So please send your questions through using the chat function. So without further ado, let me introduce today's speakers uh, before handing over to them to speak. Um, uh, to begin with, uh, Professor James Hyam will start. James is Professor of Sustainable Tourism at the Otago Business School at the University of Otago in New Zealand. He has longstanding interests in the broad field of tourism and global environmental change, which his research has explored at the global, national and local scales of analysis. Over the course of the last decade, James's research has addressed aspects of high carbon tourist transportation with a particular focus on aviation emissions. James is also part of an international research collaboration with uh, Associate Professor Debbie Hopkins, our second speaker, investigating ac academic air travel emissions. James has served as the co-editor of the Journal of Sustainable Tourism. So you've probably got emails from James if you've published in the Journal of Sustainable Tourism saying, welcome, congratulations. Uh, he's been a uh, co-editor since 2015, and in 2019, um, we had James here at Wakayama University um, as a visiting distinguished professor, and one of the key outcomes was his 2018 book uh, on sport tourism development, the Japanese translation of that book with Associate Professor Eiji Ito. He also worked closely with Professor Kumi Kato and addressed the Japan National Tourist Office in the Tokyo Symposium on Sustainable Tourism Development. So welcome, James, and thank you again. Um, so uh, uh, I'd like to also introduce Debbie Hopkins and then uh, the two speakers will take it away. Debbie is an associate professor in human geography, jointly appointed between the School of Geography and the Environment and the Sustainable Urban Development Program at the University of Oxford. Debbie has a master's degree in geography from King's College London. She also completed a PhD at the University of Otago supervised by James. And during her postdoctoral position at the Center for Sustainability at the University of Otago, that James and Debbie began their research into academic mobilities. So Debbie is also the editor in chief of the Association of American Geographers Review of Books, associate editor of Transport and Mobilities of the Journal of Sustainable Tourism, and sits on the editorial board of the Journal of Transport Geography. Debbie's research is broadly concerned with low carbon transitions and Debbie has co-edited two books. The first one, Low Carbon Mobility Transitions, co-edited with James, and Transitions in Energy Efficiency and Demand 
co-edited with Kirsten Jenkins. So enough from me, I'll hand you over to the, the, the two speakers this evening, James and Debbie, welcome. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, thank you for that uh, kind invitation. Hope you can hear me. Um, it's, uh, it's an absolute delight to uh, have the opportunity to, to speak to uh, such a, an international audience, uh, particularly from the comfort of my own living room. Um, no uh, carbon emissions and uh, no jet lag uh, and a great opportunity to, uh, to connect with, uh, with people in the global academic community. So thank you, Joseph. I want to begin by acknowledging the uh, Centre for Tourism Research and uh, the University of Wakayama for this, uh, for this opportunity to speak and the various sponsors you've mentioned, Joseph. Um, and uh, uh, we're very grateful that, uh, that you've invited us, uh, Debbie and myself, to, uh, to present this, uh, this, um, to this uh, webinar audience. Uh, let me begin uh, with some acknowledgements. Uh, Debbie and I initiated this research program some six or seven years ago when we were colleagues at the University of Otago um, with, uh, with some of our other colleagues, Sarah Tapp, Caroline Orcheston, Tyra Duncan. Um, and uh, it's proved to be an extremely timely program of research. Uh, we would also like to acknowledge our colleagues uh, who we've collaborated with uh, and whose uh, collaborative work we are um, presenting this evening. We'd both like to uh, acknowledge Milan Kloa and Miles Allen from uh, the University of Oxford. Um, much of the work that I'm presenting this evening was led by Milan um, and uh, his analysis. Um, Debbie, of course, would like to also thank uh, Noah Berkstead Breen and Milan, uh, colleagues of hers at Oxford. Um, and so we're very much uh, speaking on behalf of uh, past and current collaborators with whom we've worked on, on this uh, rather timely uh, area of research. The context, of course, is uh, that we live in a very high carbon transportation regime, um, very dependent uh, historically on uh, high carbon transportation. Uh, and we list here uh, on this slide some of the inescapable realities of, uh, of the transportation re regime um, increasing demand for high-speed, long-haul uh, travel. Um, globally, uh, when we talk about tourism, um, the trends have been towards short length of stay, decreasing value um, uh, tourism with uh, high environmental externalities. And perhaps most critically, uh, those externalities have been omitted from measures to, uh, to mitigate the, uh, the, the global impacts uh, of uh, high carbon transportation in terms of climate change. This slide I find particularly useful. Um, it comes to us courtesy of, uh, of our colleague Paul Peters um, in the Netherlands. And uh, I find this particularly, uh, particularly useful. I often use this uh, in discussions with students. Uh, so very briefly, um, we have uh, intersection uh, of lines here. Uh, the bold line uh, demonstrates the energy intensity of, of aviation uh, from the 1940s and 50s um, with piston powered airlines, uh, propeller powered airlines uh, through into the 60s and the subsequent decades moving into jet aviation. And we can see that uh, solid black line moving from top left to bottom right uh, indicates uh, increasing energy efficiency of jet aviation over those decades uh, from the 60s, um, particularly through into the 80s, but uh, at a steadily decreasing rate of increasing efficiency gains to the point that uh, the airline um, designs that, uh, that are most efficient in our skies, uh, Airbus's A380 and A350, uh, and also Boeing's Dreamliner, the 787, uh, uh, have, 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 are the most energy efficient planes and jet aircraft fl uh, flying, but, uh, but their en energy efficiency gains have become more and more marginal um, with uh, the progression of time. And so Paul uh, explains to us that the jet e uh, engine has achieved its evolutionary sophistication. Um, and there are such marginal further gains available that uh, really, over the coming decades, unless there is a radical shift in uh, aviation technologies, 
uh, we cannot expect technologies to, um, to provide a silver bullet solution to uh, the high carbon um, output of, uh, of air transportation. And then we also have depicted here uh, global aviation emissions, uh, the, the dotted line moving from bottom left uh, to, uh, to top right, which uh, illustrates the global carbon footprint of aviation. And so obviously, despite the uh, in increasing efficiency gains over those decades, the sheer increasing volume of air passenger transportation uh, has resulted in this skyrocketing carbon footprint. Uh, so these are, these are inescapable realities that, uh, that we really have to confront. This led uh, to a paper uh, that, uh, that uh, some colleagues and I uh, published, led by Paul, uh, published I think in 2016, um, looking at uh, technology myths and how aviation technology myths were being perpetuated in, uh, in print media, um, offering hope, uh, what we claimed was false hope, of technology solutions to, uh, to relieve us of our, our environmental burden and our environmental stresses associated with uh, the um, global aviation regime. So we need solutions other than relying on um, the possibility that uh, technologies will solve this, this problem for us. Of course, amongst uh, the um, high in, uh, air, air travel um, population, our academics, ourselves. Um, and uh, we've known this for, for some considerable time. Uh, there's been obviously a delay in our, our reaction to this. The status quo has perpetuated. And now, of course, COVID provides us with this, um, this uh, unanticipated, uh, unexpected, but uh, incredible opportunity to rethink the way that we uh, function as academics. This uh, article from the Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, January 2008, 12 years ago, uh, nearly 13 years ago, um, claiming that academic travel causes global warming. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the small print recognizes that this is a bit of a stretch, but um, a really important point nonetheless, academics do fly and they do fly a lot. Uh, and we found it, um, uh, within us, within us to turn a blind eye to uh, the high environmental cost of our academic aero mobilities. Uh, but this is something that Debbie and I became acutely aware of and very, very conscious of when we were uh, collaborating uh, and when we were colleagues here at the University of Otago, which uh, rightfully claims to be perhaps the most geographically distant and remote um, internationally recognized uh, institution in the world. And when we or our colleagues flew to attend conferences, typically we were flying vast distances. That leads us to uh, the analysis that we're going to present in the first part of, uh, of this webinar. Uh, and this is the, the paper uh, recently published in, in July this year uh, that uh, as I say, led by Milan and his analysis of ways to decarbonize conference travel uh, and the timeliness of his analysis, which was conducted in the very late stages of 2019, uh, has been really highlighted by the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and uh, how our uh, academic conferencing practices have been forced to change in light of, uh, of the, uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So uh, just by way of context, academics are very frequent flyers. Pre-COVID, uh, we, we flew um, a lot. Um, and of course, uh, our flying practices are enormously inequitable. Um, data here from, uh, from, from general tourist transportation in the UK, about 15% of the population is responsible for approximately 70% of flights. And if you look at other mature, um, highly aeromobile uh, societies, such as uh, the USA, exactly the same, a very small proportion of the total population consuming the vast majority of flights. So academics are part of this hypermobile minority. And uh, of course, academics, particularly climate scientists, uh, are acutely aware of the negative impacts of their air travel. But prior to COVID, as I say, we were able to um, turn a blind eye to that and uh, to 
um, continue to not question uh, those uh, flying practices. The uh, analysis that Milan led focused on the AGU, the American Geophysical Union, um, the world's largest earth and space science conference. Um, the analysis focused on uh, the 2019 meeting of, uh, of the AGU hosted in San Francisco, attended by 28,000 delegates who between them traveled 285 million kilometers, um, the equivalent of flying from the earth to the sun twice, emitting in doing so an eye-watering 80,000 tons of carbon dioxide. So um, very large conference, of course, um, very large um, carbon footprint, uh, and uh, very worthy of uh, critical analysis uh, in terms of how to uh, reduce that, uh, that carbon footprint. Uh, the analysis uh, focused on the travel patterns of the uh, conference delegation based on some assumptions that uh, those who traveled more than 400 kilometers were likely to have flown 92% of uh, the total delegation. Uh, the remaining eight were assumed to have used car, bus or train. Um, we found that 75% of uh, the emissions arose from long haul or multiple long haul intercontinental flights uh, of distances 8,000 kilometers or more. And you can see here the, um, the proportion of attendees and the distances flown and uh, the emissions produced. 39% um, of emissions produced by 17% of delegates, those traveling furthest, obviously, from uh, places such as India and Australia. This, uh, this figure, I think, really nicely illustrates it. Uh, at the very center, of course, we have uh, San Francisco, uh, the host city. Um, and you can see those, uh, the, the, the radius of 4,000 kilometers traveled or 8,000 kilometers traveled. And uh, here you can see the um, sheer volume of uh, conference delegates traveling across those distances uh, to attend the conference uh, in San Francisco. Uh, we found uh, that by focusing on those closest to the host city, um, only 2% of emissions were generated by the 22% of delegates uh, who traveled the least distance. Um, these are people who took flights of less than 1500 kilometers or used surface transportation. Uh, and this I think is uh, of course really insightful because uh, often we might think about uh, using um, conference venues that are well served by, for example, regional rail networks, such as uh, places like um, Vienna uh, or Paris in Europe. But uh, the reality is that uh, using those sorts of conference venues to allow those who uh, travel the least distances uh, to attend conferences will only ever uh, reduce the carbon footprint of a conference by uh, a relatively uh, insignificant amount. The analysis uh, looked at um, modeling different host cities to see if uh, different host cities in this particular case within North America might uh, alleviate the carbon footprint. And here you can see uh, the potential to reduce uh, the carbon footprint by 8% um, or 12% if the conference was hosted elsewhere, um, Washington DC or Chicago. Um, within North America, Chicago offered an optimum location. By contrast, uh, if the North American conference was hosted in Hawaii, the carbon footprint uh, of the, the uh, 2019 AGU would have increased by 42%. Of course, um, Hawaii is uh, 4,000 kilometers from the, uh, the western seaboard of, uh, of the USA. So the vast majority of delegates would have to fly at least 4,000 kilometers. This is really interesting in terms of New Zealand's place in the world. Um, if we're talking about uh, the least sustainable conference uh, hosting cities, um, New Zealand would be alongside Hawaii for the very same reasons. The vast majority of international delegates would have to fly vast distances to uh, attend uh, conferences in New Zealand. Once again, I'm just having problems here advancing the slides. There we go. 
Uh, then, of course, there are variations uh, on the calculations. Um, here you can see various uh, alternative scenarios or additional scenarios. I've, I've uh, mentioned the, uh, the host cities. Uh, what about uh, having 17% of the con uh, conference delegation attend virtually? That would bring the conference uh, carbon footprint down by 39%. And of course, biennial conferences, why should we host these conferences annually? Uh, is that necessary if we were to host them every other year in alternate years? Of course, that would immediately reduce the carbon footprint of a conference by 50%. Um, and now you can see on this slide uh, combinations of steps that we might take to reduce the carbon footprint. Um, so uh, moving towards the right of the slide, a biennial conference, i.e. a conference hosted uh, in alternate years, with 36% uh, those who travel the greatest distances actually attending virtually rather than in person and hosted in Chicago, that combination of steps would reduce the carbon footprint of this conference by 91%. And of course, fully virtual um, does have a carbon footprint, but so insignificant that essentially a fully virtual conference or the sorts of interactions that we're engaging in this evening uh, in this webinar uh, almost completely eliminates the carbon footprint of such meetings. So uh, here again, a summary slide that uh, illustrates uh, various options on the left-hand side, combinations of options, um, modeling the carbon footprint of different host cities, assuming the same delegation, um, encouraging virtual participation, and moving to biennial conferences, which clearly uh, allow us to reduce almost entirely the carbon footprints of these conferencing activities. So this led uh, to a further consideration of, uh, of a three hub model of um, uh, conferencing activities. Uh, so let me just uh, summarize the thinking here. Um, of course, the AGU is uh, one of uh, several uh, geophysical conferences uh, each year. The EGU was hosted this year in Vienna. Um, the, the Japan Geoscience Union in Tokyo scheduled for May, and of course, sorry, this is uh, last year, and the AGU uh, fall meeting in uh, the latter part of 2019. How about combining all of these geoscience conferences into a single World Geoscience Union? So here we're talking about a three hub model where these conferences would be scheduled to coincide. They would take place simultaneously in three hub locations. Again, those locations, those host locations can be modeled to uh, reduce the carbon footprint. And you can see here that by doing so, in combination with dedicated virtual room facilities to allow everyone to participate, uh, encouraging attendees to travel to their nearest hub um, to uh, attend uh, the conference in that hub in person, but reducing the need for intercontinental long haul travel would reduce the uh, carbon emissions of all three of these unions by a combined 80%. And so again, if I just return to this slide very briefly, you can see in fact that the, th the uh, conference delegation uh, actually lends itself very conveniently to hubs in Asia, uh, in Tokyo, in Europe, uh, a hub in Paris and uh, in North America. And uh, if uh, further hubs were required, uh, again, a, uh, an analysis like this highlights the fact that a fourth hub might be located in South Asia, um, if needed, to further reduce the carbon footprint of, uh, of this conference. So, of course, there are disadvantages. Um, the, there may be disadvantages, for example, uh, for academics in the Southern Hemisphere, given that all three hubs uh, proposed here are in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, this model may privilege um, academics who already benefit from access to these uh, sorts of conferences. Um, but of course, fully virtual conferences may provide more e equity in some respects. And it's really important, I think, that, uh, that we think about this. This, of course, is going to lead into uh, some of Debbie's uh, very recent uh, analyses. Uh, Equally, virtual conferences would help young researchers to gl gain global exposure, particularly those who perhaps may be um, unable to normally attend conferences, lack resources to, uh, to network globally uh, through, uh, through conferences. 
So the three hub model may in fact help uh, academics, perhaps particularly young academics um, from developing world countries to overcome barriers to attendance. But these sorts of questions, of course, are really critical. We're finding ways now to radically reduce the carbon footprint of our conferencing activities, but we need to do so in ways that are also uh, conscious of um, overcoming existing inequalities, but also uh, anticipating emerging or new inequalities. And I'll just finish with, uh, with this slide um, from uh, uh, a paper published recently in the Journal of Cleaner Production, um, a very interesting paper based on analysis from the University of British Columbia uh, by Seth Wines and, uh, and colleagues. This paper was particularly interesting because it disproved the relationship in an analysis of colleagues from the University of British Columbia that those who travel more actually advance or accelerate their uh, careers faster than those who travel less. So really drawing into, the, into question that relationship between uh, academic air travel and uh, co uh, career uh, progression and advancement. I'll hand over to you now, Debbie. Okay, so as far as I know, you can see my slides. If anyone can't see my slides, please shout out. Um, so uh, lovely to be here with you all today um, from, from Oxford. Um, so this is an image um, of uh, some of the uh, congregation of, of Oxford, which is sort of the governing um, uh, institution of the university. And each year the vice chancellor gives an oration. And this is the vice chancellor in 2019, uh, Professor Louise Richardson, um, giving that oration from which she reflects on the previous year and thinks about what's to come. At this point in time, she could never really have known what was going to come in this, in this last year um, with coronavirus coming um, shortly afterwards. But she did set in motion during this presentation um, some of the work that I'm going to be talking about now. Um, so in this uh, oration, Professor Richardson spoke about climate change as a challenge that the university had to meet. And I quote, she said, it is time to ask ourselves what we should do. At an individual level, we can reduce our carbon emissions by how we live, what we consume and how we travel. At an institutional level, we can examine our own practices and targets and ask if they're enough. The university is committed to halving our emissions by 2030 from a peak in 2010, notwithstanding extensive growth of the university. She listed a number of actions that were already um, underway and asked, I quote, um, is it, it is worth asking ourselves whether we believe these commitments are equal to the gravity of the threat. Personally, I am not convinced they are. I think we could do more. And over the next year, I believe that we will. She said, this is not a time for gestures. This is not a time for aspirational targets with no means to achieve them. It is time for evidence-based policymaking. But it was from here that things became a little bit complicated. She said, and I quote, it is important to remind ourselves that whatever we do in our personal behavior and whatever institutional actions we take to make ourselves more sustainable, it will have insufficient impact on climate change itself at a time when global emissions of carbon are 35 billion tons a year. I believe that when confronting a problem on the scale of climate change, our primary responsibility as a university is to do what we do best, research, teach, and translate the findings of that research for the betterment of society. And this reminded me of something that I saw um, in the university magazine um, of the University of Otago, where James and I met um, also with um, Adam During, who uh, I know is at your university. And this was the magazine that I received in October 29, uh, uh, 2019. And the vice chancellor, Professor Harleen Hain, um, talked about the importance of travel. So you can see here from the quote, I'm a firm believer that travel broadens the mind. And she goes on to say, I've had the great pleasure of hosting a large number of international visitors to New Zealand. It was at this same time that the oration was happening uh, in Oxford and also that the New Zealand government passed the Climate Change Response Zero Carbon Amendment Act. My point here is that travel and the right to mobility seems to have become so deeply embedded in academic practice that it's hard to detangle. For the University of Oxford, there is this conversation about reducing carbon emissions without actually acknowledging that the very system of academic practice is so entrenched in carbon emissions and in the practice of flying that actually making meaningful change um, at the, in the timescale that's required is going to be immensely challenging. 
So today I'm going to be talking about a pilot study that we have been running over the last couple of months uh, in um, Oxford. And this is on the back of the Oxford Sustainability Strategy, which has emerged from the, um, the Vice Chancellor's oration in 2019 with a desire to reduce carbon emissions across the university. Um, and at the moment, it's reported that around um, 30,000 tonnes of carbon could be attributed to staff flying on business travel. But there are many issues associated with this. So what constitutes work-related travel? Um, what happens to university teaching and student emissions? How does the structure of teaching um, and various accommodation regulations and such like mean that we entrench further mobility um, of students? And how does reporting and recording of flights take place? The University of Oxford has the college system, which means that um, we have a strange relationship between the university colleges and the university itself. And actually this creates some gray areas about where emissions are allocated and who's responsible for them because it's not one legal entity. So what we did was um, we focused on one university college. So within this college, it's become somewhat of a microcosm of the wider university because there's multiple um, disciplines and the university divisions are represented. There are staff that are employed solely by the college, some that have split appointments between the college and the university. Um, and there's obviously students and professional admin administrative staff um, there as well. So we used this as a, a, a pilot study to test out this mixed method approach. So we did an online survey, which was between um, July and August in 2019. And then we followed that on uh, with interviews, which were run on Teams. Our intention is to scale this up to the whole institution um, in the coming year. So this is our sample. Um, Probably as expected, we ended up receiving responses from the survey from more students than um, staff. But to this point, student perspectives on academic travel have been largely omitted. And because of what James was talking about in terms of junior colleagues, early career researchers, um, and their needs around um, expanding networks, the increasing precarity of uh, academic job market, um, there is a, a, a really good reason for including students um, in, this, in this conversation. We also included professional and administrative staff because a lot of travel also occurs, not by academics, but by people in uh, positions around the university doing activities for outreach um, with alumni associations and so on. Um, the sample was skewed towards a yeah, younger age demographic because of the, um, the student uh, um, focus. So what did we find? Well, very simply, we found that an awful lot of people weren't traveling particularly. So we found that 37% uh, hadn't flown at all in the year before COVID. So in the 12 months preceding um, the end of March 29, uh, 2020. Um, and we found that over 50% had either not flown or just done one return flight uh, in that period. Um, and then we found that 15%, so 15 um, uh, people within the survey um, had flown over, uh, well, say 18, 19% had flown over five return flights um, in that previous 12 months. So I should say here that this is very preliminary analysis. So we've only just started going through this. So um, this is just indicative uh, findings at the moment. But of course, we it, probably to be expected, um, there is a difference between contract type. And um, so at the college level, many of the academic staff will still be on fixed term contracts. At the University of Oxford, on average, I think it's believed that something around 80% of academic staff are on fixed term contracts. Um, so there is a high uh, proportion of the academic staff that are still on some sort of precarious contracting um, system. So what we found here was that those that were taking the most flights from just the academics um, were actually those on permanent contracts. So that would have been associate professors and professors um, at the university level. Because of this, it raises, it raises a series of questions about how that mobility then becomes um, entrenched in the mindset of success and prestige, that once you have become more senior, um, you will be traveling more. So then it's an aspirational uh, mobility for more junior colleagues uh, who are wishing to replicate um, and to get more secure contracts. So 70% of the flights in the survey had just one trip purpose. And this was interesting to us because uh, from the work that New, uh, in New Zealand that uh, James and I had done with our colleagues, we'd found that actually many people spoke about multiple reasons for doing travel uh, in New Zealand. 
in Oxford, we found that a lot of these trips were for a single purpose. Um, and so we did this based on three previous uh, trips that we asked them, specific details about where they had gone to, what they had done, um, actually on a particular, um, a particular travel period. Um, so this shows us the importance of different types of um, participation at conferences. And we split it up by the humanities and social science, um, the uh, hard sciences and the, the medical sciences. Um, and what we found was that for the medical sciences and the physical sciences, academic meetings seem to be far more important. Um, but actually we found that conferences across the board were relatively um, important uh, for, for all academics. Um, obviously here at the end, we can see the, the social reasons for traveling. So visiting friends and relatives and leisure, um, which often intersected with uh, the, the academic or the professional purposes for travel. What we found also, so we asked from those three trips that, that we asked uh, the participants to report on, we then asked them to reflect on that trip and ask them how productive they felt the trip had been and how important it was. So upon reflection, having returned from that journey, how important was it that you went and did that trip? How productive do you think the trip was? Did it achieve its purposes um, and what you wanted to achieve from it? So you can see the vast majority um, of respondents are in that top left corner. Um, so saying that it was very important and it was very productive. But actually what we can also see from this is that there are a number of trips um, for which the respondents did not feel they were particularly productive and didn't feel they were particularly important. Um, and whilst this is a minority of trips articulated in this formulation, um, it's worth figuring out what it was about those trips um, that meant that they weren't perceived to be productive, they weren't perceived to be important, and whether they were trips that these that academics might feel that they could forego in the future or use different, different types of travel for. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, with some of the qualitative uh, findings. We tried to uncover what um, constituted necessary travel for particular purposes. So based on your contract type, based on your discipline and um, your area of research, whatever it might be, how do you think um, or what do you think constitutes necessary uh, in that context? And what we found was um, a range of perspectives, but I thought this one was particularly good and I'm not going to read all of it, um, but it was a critique of our question, which if anyone's ever done research on academics, they'll find that this always comes up. There's always a critique of the terms that you've used. Um, and this person actually really accurately articulated why we cared, why we actually were asking them the question about necessity in the first place. They said people have managed to do science during this pandemic, but it's almost certainly the case that science has been hampered significantly in its progress. The only reason somebody might argue that travel is necessary is that not attending any particular international conference may be seen as losing ground in comparison with scientific competitors. So he was talking not only about the, um, the problems associated with not being able to travel, but also that there's a competitive advantage attached to traveling. So that if, if some institutions prevent travel and others allow it, that that might lead to um, a dual system. They might lead to, to winners and losers. Um, and this is really problematic and suggests roles for other um, actors uh, beyond the institutions themselves. This is a series of quotes that came from our interviews um, that we conducted after the survey. Uh, again, asking them to unpick what it was about, um, about flying that was particularly important or travel in general, but also flying. Um, and they, used, they said things like, flying is often unavoidable. Nothing is strictly necessary, but I would consider international conferences a valid reason for flying. Not being able to fly would be a significant headwind for dissemination and face-to-face -face communication is necessary for scientific ideas. We found that many of our participants from the survey respondents hadn't considered an alternative form of transport. So they hadn't considered whether they could go by a mode other than flying. Um, and also they didn't necessarily feel on the whole that they could replicate the purpose of their trip using virtual technologies. Again, it does show that there is some clustering, that some parts of travel might be replicated, but those that have multiple purposes, it becomes harder to disentangle and say, well, if some of this could happen virtually, would it mean that other travel wouldn't happen at all? Um, and this is something that James and I have talked about in our previous work with the connections between our uh, personal travel um, and our professional travel. So thinking about video conferencing and the, the value of virtual engagements, we found that um, 
there was largely negative perception. So bearing in mind that this, these interviews happened in um, August and September. So we had had a period of six months of these types of webinars, online engagements. And across the board, there were these perceptions that video conferencing just doesn't cut it. In-person conferences are much better. And much of this was about the random encounters that might happen, the potential for encounters, not necessarily the expectation that they would, but if they did, how important those encounters might be. And there was a fear of missing that randomness, that, that um, happenstance where you might come across somebody um, and, and build a collaboration or have an opportunity arise from it. And because of that, there was a lack of um, uh, willingness to stop traveling just in case just in case that could happen. And after COVID, we asked many questions about what might happen um, uh, in, a, in a potentially post COVID or living with COVID in different ways kind of world. Um, and across the board, again, there were perceptions that people just wanted to get back traveling. And so here, um, one of our, our academics spoke about just, just sort of the, um, small sample conversations with colleagues where most people were excited to get traveling again and looking forward to being back, going to conferences, going to meetings um, and how significant that might be for travel in the future. In our survey, we did ask about this and we found very random uh, responses. Um, so with some people saying that they actually thought their travel would increase after COVID because they had travel that they wanted to make up on. Um, or they had promised to travel as part of grant applications that they then needed to do. So they were going to accelerate and to accommodate that. Um, a lot of people felt they would do about the same, but we did find proportions for both activities where people said that they would probably travel less. And it will be interesting to see how this plays out in the next uh, 12 months to two years. So in conclusion, from our survey and from these very preliminary um, insights uh, that I presented today, it becomes clear that it's a multi-act and multi-institutional intervention that's required. Individual institutions on their own are going to struggle to get buy-in from academics who may feel that they are being disadvantaged in comparison to their um, colleagues overseas or at different institutions domestically. From our work, um, the, the paper that James described with, with Milan and Miles, we talked about how we might embed this new conference convention. So thinking about conferencing differently. So James showed that there are gains to be made from thinking about conferences in different ways. And I've shown that there is still, there remains um, pushback to having conferences in different ways, that people want the random encounters that can happen from personal engagement. So the model that we proposed in the um, Nature paper offers some of this because it offers hubs where people can still have random chance encounters and um, whilst preventing the long haul air travel of having um, uh, traveling to North America from, from the UK, for example. So some of this uh, points to these different institutions, these different people that need to be involved in the conversation, academic institutionals and professional bodies, for example, moving to biannual conferences. So removing the, the lock-in to these annual um, uh, habitual meetings. Funding bodies, considering carbon budgets as part of grant applications. We're already doing budgeting for our financial um, uh, commitments. How about we think about how carbon fits into um, our research practices as well? Academic institutions investing in virtual technologies. This is a conversation we're having at Oxford all of the time about whether we have sufficient support to allow us to do our work online, the quality that we want to do it. Um, and I think that that's really important. The support we've had today around running these types of events is just so important and it means that things run smoothly. For researchers about role modeling, this is really significant. If, academic, if senior academics are seen to always be mobile, there is a motivation for junior colleagues to be aspiring for that mobility um, in their own practice. And conference organizers, thinking about these hubs, thinking about having regional hubs that will reduce the distance that academics need to travel to, um, to go to these conferences, to still get these random encounters, these face-to-face -face interactions. So in our paper, we conclude by saying that only through concerted and coordinated effort will the transition um, take place. COVID has taught us that changes do happen at remarkable speed when they need to, but we don't have any um, evidence to suggest that this is going to maintain in the long term. Things actually need, action needs to be taken um, to allow this to continue. And I'll finish with um, this from, from Twitter. 
uh, thinking about the conversation moving within one year. So before COVID, the work that James has led um, looking at uh, virtual attendance, where people were just saying virtual doesn't work. During Corona, wow, it brings so many benefits. And yes, it does work actually. And post Corona, how dare we to have exchanged in such an unsustainable and non-inclusive way. I think that this is a really lovely idea. Um, however, from our, albeit very small sample uh, in, in the UK at the moment, we're still finding major pushback. And some of that could be fatigue from teaching, researching, um, engaging online um, all day, every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, James. Um, um, <laughs> much to think about there. Um, as I um, look at my conference calendar that was for 2020. Uh, <laughs> but um, we have a few questions that have come through and I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them. So I'll just paraphrase some of them. And uh, to some degree, as, as, as your talk went on, you answered a lot of the questions, but I'll try and go through some of them now. Uh, the first one I will ask um, is, is to both of you. So feel free to um, chip in. Um, Ayako Ezaki from Training Aid or Train Aid uh, has, has asked a very important question that James has touched on, the question about equity. She says that wealthy people in rich countries have been using up most of the world's carbon budget by enjoying the privilege of flying and leading high emission lifestyles. To achieve equity while trying to decarbonize travel, could there be some kind of carbon budget balancing system where we encourage and prioritize air travel by those from disadvantaged um, contexts? I think that's a, that's a really good question. And I think it's a very, very uh, fair comment. Um, there are all sorts of existing inequities and we, we have to be conscious of these. In fact, I've been looking at some of the questions that, uh, that were coming through while Debbie was speaking and, and just some fantastic comments. Um, there are all sorts of inequities, uh, historical inequities, and we need to be really conscious of this. Um, I'm also conscious uh, for example, of junior colleagues who may potentially be denied the enormous benefits that I um, enjoyed in my own early career of traveling to conferences and networking and, and building collaborations and building profile and having those um, serendipitous conversations that Debbie alluded to. Um, these are very real in inequities and uh, one of the things that we did think about when we were working on the paper in the, in the earlier part of this year was uh, the potential for emerging inequalities. It may be that uh, where you have three hubs um, in the Northern Hemisphere, that there will be new emerging inequalities associated with those who are privileged by proximity to those hubs, having greater access uh, to, um, to those uh, conference venues. Uh, whereas people again in the Southern Hemisphere may have uh, less access um, to, those, uh, to those conferences. But I've mentioned another thing, uh, something really interesting. The European Geosciences Union moved online with COVID. And uh, with the move online, the number of delegates increased from 16,000 to 22,000, including attendees from 28 previously unrepresented countries. So uh, the question is a very real one and uh, there will be shifting uh, inequities, and we need to be very conscious of these. Amy, did you want to I'll add? Just very, yeah, I'll just quickly add to it that I, I completely agree, and I think it's a brilliant question. I think it's a really important question. Um, and certainly, I think that we need to have ways of um, accounting for the fact that, uh, of historical inequalities and how that plays out um, at the moment. So when we were doing the uh, page, paper with Milan and Miles, we had conversations about this, about are we doing these hubs on the basis of where is the most, uh, where would reduce the carbon emissions or do we add an equity component to this? And I think that the, the, the growing work around just transitions um, and other associated um, uh, bodies of literature really point us to the fact that we can't look at um, climate change in isolation from other issues, from, um, uh, um, a, a range of inequalities across a broad spectrum um, of issues that need to be part of our responses and, and carbon alone, um, it, it just can't be understood in isolation from all of that, I guess. Okay, thank you both. Uh, the next question comes from one of your colleagues, um, uh, Debbie, Hannah Delgleish, 
she she poses the question the university of ghent has a, has a rule that people can't fly the location is reachable by train in less than six hours can we somehow encourage other universities to do this? And what are your opinions of hy hybrid conferences? And this makes me think of colleagues in Tahiti two weeks ago who advertised call for papers for a conference in Tahiti, right? So <laughs> for those of us who live in Australia or New Zealand or even in Japan, um, you know, um, th this is something that's more difficult for us to reconcile with. So what do you both think about the opinions of hybrid conferences and transport mobilities? Do you want me to go first, Debbie? James? Do you want to lead that yeah. one, Debbie? I, I, you know, the train thing, uh, if I understood correctly, is it that, so Hannah's University encourages train travel because of its, it, its uh, function of it. So Oxford, actually, there's a very interesting anecdote that Oxford is a really frustrating place to get to by train because the powers to be in the years that they were putting in the train network said trains will never take off, we have canals. And so we're actually a very difficult place to get to by train. And um, so for um, many people, actually accessing Oxford by train is very frustrating, although that is the main way we access it. Um, but coming from New Zealand, where we had no opportunity. So the, uh, the Centre for Sustainability, we looked into how to get to Wellington um, on the, the bottom of the North Island and um, not using train uh, airplanes. And we found it would take basically 24 hours. It required buses, trains and boats to get there. And we would arrive at three o'clock in the morning. Um, it was, you know, it was so unfeasible. And coming back to the UK and seeing the train network, I thought, brilliant, I'm going to get to use it loads. Actually, it's really expensive um, and it's really tricky to use. And so in our work in Oxford, we've looked specifically at um, using alternative modes to get to Europe. And the, the barriers we found are that it's so much more expensive than aviation. And we still have university policies that prioritise the cheapest fare, which means that they end up automatically going by um, plane. Um, that it takes longer, but that's not necessarily such a barrier, um, but there needs to be university support for the additional travel time, um, and that the booking systems can be incredibly complicated. But actually, being in Europe now means that we are able to use trains to get to a range of different places on the continent, um, and domestically, but still we have all of these barriers that sit in place, and I've been really surprised um, about these since I moved back to the UK. I, I would uh, just chip in and say that it's great to hear that uh, train train uh, travel is 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 um, being encouraged uh, in Europe. Um, we hosted a conference in Freiburg in 2012, uh, which we which we repeated biennially two other times, and the conference venue was was quite deliberate to encourage uh, people to use the rail network in Europe to uh, to travel to and from the conference. But we were we were really disappointed to find that most of the delegates at uh, at our workshop had actually flown because their institution institutions didn't allow them to book uh, conference travel by any other transport mode other than plane. Um, so that is a, a step in the right direction. Um, of course, when we're talking about conference uh, destinations like uh, Tahiti, and certainly when we're talking about uh, academics traveling from places like New Zealand to attend international conferences. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, it's just impossible for us to to deny the um, the profligate nature of that air travel. I've uh, I've had colleagues uh, and I've done it myself fly to Europe for a conference and literally turn around and come back straight away. Um, and uh, you know that uh, that that uh, form of, of conference travel just uh, is is unacceptable in this day and age. Um, so the move to hybrid conferences, I'm I'm not familiar with that terminology, Joseph, but I'm, I'm guessing you mean uh, a hybrid uh, combination of in-person and virtual attendees. Yep. Um, certainly, from a, a, a New Zealand uh, far-flung New Zealand perspective, it's uh, it's absolutely essential if we're to remain uh, connected globally. Um, and if we're going to continue to, to, to disseminate knowledge. I think it's fantastic to be talking on this platform right now. It's nearly 10 p.m. here, but uh, to be able to speak to a global audience um, without having to relocate is just an absolute privilege. Okay, the, the next question, if I may, comes from um, uh, Ferdi Sijabat in, at SDIES College in Banda Aceh, Indonesia. And it go, goes along, uh, feeds off your, your last comment, James, he, uh, the question is, um, uh, this decarbonisation um, um, approach, does it weaken the motivation of academics in terms of disseminating their knowledge and would it make the spread of knowledge slower and more constrained than before? No, I don't think so. 
um, the uh, the transitions that I've been making uh, in uh, recent years um, have uh, encouraged me to think of all sorts of different ways of disseminating knowledge. Um, and in fact, I haven't uh, used conferences as a principal means of disseminating research findings for well over a decade, many years. Um, I find that uh, my evolving strategy uh, is far less reliant on travel um, and far more targeted at a diverse range of outlets, uh, reaching a diverse range of audiences. So uh, my dissemination practices, of course, uh, have focused on journal publication and other academic outlets, but have diversified to uh, policy outlets, uh, media outlets, broader public audiences, uh, film, other media, um, instantaneous um, uh, communications that don't require us to register in advance for a conference, wait for the conference and travel to the conference. Uh, Debbie finished the, the presentation with, uh, with a, 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 some, some quotes from Twitter, uh, to have papers that can be published quickly uh, and then disseminated and go viral via Twitter is an incredibly powerful way of reaching broad, global and diverse audiences. I just have a small addition to this. Um, one is to say there are huge disciplinary differences. And um, I think we always need to be very careful not to overlook that there's some disciplines for whom conferences and conference presentations are the primary source of dissemination. And we do need to pay attention to that. So institutions looking at think, uh, uh, putting in strategies to reduce travel need to pay attention to the fact that for some uh, divisions, it might be different. And uh, there needs to be some thought put into that about maybe using the model that we described about using different types of models and um, not just prioritizing international conferences. I know in our, our early work in New Zealand, we found university policy that basically entrenched this idea that domestic um, uh, conferences were subpar, that they, were, they weren't as good, they weren't as rigorous, they weren't as important. Um, and that needs to be done away with. Um, but also that conferences like James said, actually, they probably aren't the main source of uh, uh, primary sort of place for dissemination for many people. They actually have such a range of purposes and for many people, it is actually less about disseminating their own research or learning from other people, but more about kind of getting a scope of the discipline or meeting people or, you know, all of these looking for jobs. And um, particularly the AAG, the Association of American Geographers, is where geography students go to get jobs. And um, so they have all of these different purposes that we need to be thinking about as well, not just dissemination. But many of those purposes can also be replicated in other models. And I think we just need to think creatively about what, what opportunities there are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this is a question that, that goes beyond um, academic travel and, and travel more generally. Robert Kiss from Ishu University in Taiwan uh, uh, paraphrases his question. In a way, he's asking, what if we priced in the real cost of this travel? Can we still do what we, <laughs> can we still travel? Because one of the one of the things that you argue in your work is that this is one of the main reasons, right? Um, uh, the real cost of travel is rarely priced in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's a really interesting thought, um, and uh, and I really welcome these sorts of uh, ideas. Um, of course, uh, the price of air travel um, goes up; um, that will influence demand for air travel. But uh, we've already talked about uh, equity and. Um, uh, skyrocketing prices associated with air travel will only further privilege those who uh, have been privileged historically. Um, so I don't see it as a, as a, a solution on its own. Um, I think it's inevitable that the cost of air travel will increase, um, but we do need to engage in the opportunities presented to us by COVID to rethink our conference conventions um, in ways that uh, will, we hope, uh, create more equitable futures for, for, for um, conference engagement. Okay. Um, I, I agree with all of that. I think that that um, financial mechanisms on their own aren't, aren't going to do much. I think that there needs to be a balancing, like we were talking about train travel. The fact that trains are so much more expensive than, than air travel uh, in Europe um, is mind boggling. And I think that there needs to be some, some reconciliation around that. Um, uh, I think in the UK, the fact that I can fly to Edinburgh from London cheaper than I can catch the train is just nonsensical. Um, and I do think that there, there probably is something in that. 
Um, but interestingly, so I have this book here, not on purpose to advertise it because it's not mine, it's David Bannister's book, um, but it was on the floor because I was teaching from it the other day. Um, it, uh, he does analysis in this that shows that low cost air travel, um, so when we've got all of the low cost carriers around Europe, actually only serve to benefit middle class and upper middle class families who were already traveling anyway. So basically it didn't increase the spread of people that were accessing aviation, but instead the people that were flying anyway were flying more using low cost air travel. So in terms of like budget airlines, there actually isn't an equity argument in the UK on hit based on his analysis. There isn't this argument that actually it, it allows more people to travel. And, and this is only short, medium, haul sort of travel. And um, but actually that it's just helping those to travel, those that are already traveling to travel more. Um, but I, I completely agree with what James is saying in so much as we certainly don't want it to become the academics um, are unable to travel from institutions where they don't get large budgets, where they haven't got big grants to fund this travel, and um, because aviation has become so expensive, they're unable to do it. Um, and then we just create more of a distinction between those who can and those who can't travel. Okay. Um, the next question is a really interesting one because it, it highlights how in tourism, um, different, different parts of tourism will be impacted by uh, this decarbon agenda and, and COVID-19. It's from Natsumi Koike. She asks, uh, the question is about the mice industry. Some cities and countries have built their reputations on uh, um, hosting large co meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibitions. This disruption is going to be quite considerable for them. What do they do? How do they, <laughs> how do they continue? Again, a really good question, and uh, and they are going to have to uh, adapt to uh, to the new world order, um, and that may be that um, that they need to rethink their target markets. Um, certainly, COVID has required us here in New Zealand to deeply uh, reflect upon the future of tourism, um, and uh, and that's not to say that uh, that there will necessarily be less tourism in this country. And this may also be the case for, for urban destinations that have pinned their hopes on, on the mice sector. Um, but uh, what we seek, I think, in future, and, and I, I, the very research that we've been reporting and talking about this evening moves in this direction, is less regular um, air travel, but uh, not a, an end to air travel, but a change in the way that we choose to travel. And uh, in uh, our part of the world, I'd like to see us move from a conference, a traditional conference model of air travel, where we travel every year, uh, recurrently, multiple times a year, long haul, very fast, short duration, to what I refer to as a sabbatical or research and study leave model of air travel, where when we do travel, we travel less frequently, but for much longer and much richer engagements in the places that we're visiting. And in both of those models, the net tourism can actually be very similar. So we're traveling less frequently, but for much longer, means that uh, the, the total number of visitor nights, if you like, um, may, be, um, may be exactly the same. The volume of tourism doesn't change, but we seek more regular short haul nearby travel to hubs, for example. And when we do travel long haul, we do so for, a, for a, a variety of reasons and for longer duration. So um, the, the, the patterns I hope will change, uh, but not necessarily the volume of tourism. Yeah, I, I completely um, agree with that. I think that there are some um, questions about how that's supported. And um, so I think that universities need to be thinking about how they actually support this model, because at the moment we have these annual um, uh, travel funds that expire so we're encouraged to spend all of our money within one particular year or we lose it so we end up going places we don't necessarily want to go and um, just to ensure that we haven't lost that money so actually having a different relationship with how um how how funding is given um and i do think it requires different business models i don't necessarily think that um you know these conference venues uh i, I think they just it needs need some creative thinking about what can happen and how they can accommodate these types of new new uh ways of doing business and exactly as james said i think it's a scalar focus so for so long we've focused so much on this 
so-called shrinking world for some people and accessing places and going as far as we can and you know going to conferences in Hawaii from Europe and whatever it might be and even even when we're thinking about our leisure activities now thinking differently New Zealand is now actually prioritizing domestic tourists for a long time domestic tourists were just priced out of so many of the activities they wanted to do and I'm seeing my friends all over Twitter and um, Instagram showing photos of they're actually out exploring their own country and in the UK that was what happened last summer everybody started traveling around the country and going and seeing the beaches and realizing that UK isn't that terrible um, and actually maybe we don't need to go to Spain all the time um, and so this might happen, I hope that this happens with conferences as well, where we start to see that our local networks are still powerful, they're still valuable, we still have random encounters, we can still thrive academically, we can still share and learn, but we do it closer to home, we don't necessarily need all the time to be doing these long haul um, uh, flights. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we, um, we're rapidly running out of time, but one question, um, uh, and Debbie, you mentioned the necessity for multi-actor, multi-institution cooperation. Uh, how can we achieve that? Because in, in, in the academic environment, right, we're all very competitive and everyone's going off in different directions doing different studies. How do we, how do we, how do we bring everyone together? And, and Hannah Dalglish asks a similar question. How do we get all of these different societies and scientific organizations to, to put their heads together and say, we're all in this together rather than competing against each other? Yeah, I think that that is so, I mean, that's, that's a great question and it's really important and I, I wish that I knew the answer to that. Um, I have heard of so many examples in the UK of institutions not working together because they want to keep propriety knowledge in their institution or whatever it might be. So some institutions doing very, very good work that they're just not prepared to share. Um, uh, about how they're calculating their own emissions. How and actually this only works if we all do it together. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that there are roles. Um, so James and I via email have had some conversations about disciplinary bodies and um, what the role is. So for example, I mentioned the AAG before, like getting those types of um, bodies together because it needs to happen in all of these different um, domains and all these different scales because we need, say in the UK, we need the universities to come together and talk to each other, both in groups like the Russell Group, but also more generally across all universities. Um, but then we also need it to happen on a disciplinary level, because like I said, some disciplines have different relationships with conferences, they have different needs for field work, whatever it might be. So then we need disciplinary bodies to come into it as well. Um, we need funding agencies. I don't actually know how we go about coordinating this yeah. multi-scale governance of, of responses. But um, I, I would hope that there are more intelligent people than me out there that, that will actually have a, an answer to this. <laughs> I'm Jane. sorry to say there, there aren't, Debbie, um, <laughs> but uh, we'll just have to live with that uh, constraint. Um, I think that um, uh, starting with the academic associations is a really great start. Um, you know, in, in my own field, um, if the leading academic associations, uh, Corthy uh, in this part of the world, um, decrees uh, to move uh, as they are uh, and credit to them to uh, increasing virtual interactions, uh, biennial rather than annual conferences, um, these sorts of initiatives will affect all academics in my country in this discipline uh, equally. And, uh, and so there, there may be some uh, equity of approach across institutions in that sense. I was also just reading uh, a, a chat comment from Nerdania Wong, who asks the really good question about should universities revise their KPIs? And I think that's a really good point because yes, they should. And um, part of the uh, argument that we're putting forward now is that academics should be a able to apply for conference leave to attend virtual conferences, not try and squeeze them into their day, daily schedule. And in fact, perhaps also apply for virtual conference leave that allows them to be away from their um, uh, place of employment. So that they're not uh, subject to daily interruptions when they're trying to attend conference sessions, perhaps including conference, uh, virtual conference funding to allow them to stay in a hotel nearby where they live. So they're not at home and they're not at work, but they're attending the conference virtually from within their own home region. Um, and Debbie's mentioned that uh, domestic conferences historically have been devalued. 
and our institutions have, have strived for internationalization and driven academics to attend and contribute and to participate in international conferences. Well, we need to rethink those KPIs. And this then extends into um, our research assessment uh, practices, how we confirm staff, how we tenure them, how we promote them, how we evaluate the impact of their research. All of these sorts of things need to be changed through, uh, I think, university policies. Um, and as Debbie has said, we need to be doing this collaboratively. And I'm pleased to say that in this country, I've had in recent weeks some fantastic conversations with a colleague at Massey University in the North Island, and we want to move forward side by side so that there is equity between institutions uh, and that we move forward uh, collaboratively um, to address these conference conventions that we've been talking about tonight. Okay. Um, Debbie, any final comments? Thanks, James. That, that's, a, that's a good wrap up, actually. Yeah, I think James did a great job there. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you. All right. Um, can, I re can I remind everyone, if you want to know more, the, the paper in Nature is available open access, I believe. Um, if not, um, Debbie or James, I'm sure will be able to, to um, find it, to, uh, to get it to you. Um, so before we finish, I, I think everyone's giving you virtual claps. So on behalf of everyone here, thanks, uh, James and Debbie. Um, we also thank all the participants for coming along. Um, also, thanks that we behind the scenes, there is a whole team of people working away to make sure that the technical difficulties are overcome. So thanks to Acting Director of CTR, Dr. Eiji Ito, Dr. Hayato Nagai, Ms. Misato Murano and Ms. Maki Kobayashi. Thank you for your help. Um, also, um, uh, we should have a slide coming up soon, I think, uh, or not. But uh, we, we run these webinars regularly and our next event is on Friday, November the 13th. Uh, it's the uh, Centre for Tourism Research, there it is, uh, Research Forum, you, you're welcome to join us. And on Sunday, December the 6th, we'll be running a, another webinar on Sport Tourism, Mega Events in Japanese Society in Japanese. Um, so feel free to join us and look at our website uh, if, you, if, if you can. Um, so lastly, complete the pop-up poll that comes up. As good academics, we always want to measure things. So um, <laughs> uh, if you can answer the questions, it'll only take a minute or so. Um, but thank you again, Debbie and James, for, for joining us. James is going to go to bed now. Debbie's going to get started with the day. Um, <laughs> uh, and from us in, in Japan, thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Um, take care.